she was dating someone, even after telling him that she didn't want a relationship. She didn't choose him. He would not stand for this any longer. And so he decided that something had to be done. He was obsessed and no one and nothing would stand in his way or stop him. In his mind, she ended his life. And so he was going to end hers. Hello and welcome to episode 23 of Makeup and Mayhem, True Crime with me, Bella Monsoon. You may notice that I look a little bit different than I usually do at the beginning of my videos. Let me explain. So what that means is that one week I will be doing a makeup tutorial and telling you about a true crime case. And the next week I will just be telling you about a true crime case. No makeup tutorial. So I've decided to try this out based on a multitude of factors, external factors, time factors, as well as feedback factors. So this is something I will be testing out over the next few weeks to see if it works, if it is received well, and I would love to know what you guys think. So since I started this true crime series, I've wanted to bring awareness not only to the cases that shocked the nation, but also to the cases and the victims that you might never have heard of. I think it's important that every victim has the chance to have their story told in a respectful and insightful manner. So whereas you may have heard of Hannah Cornelius or Inga Lotz in the media, you may not have heard of today's victim. Her story is one that highlights what happens when obsession becomes deadly. But before we get into it, for those of you who are new, let me introduce myself. So here it is in a nutshell. I'm a mental health professional who just so happens to be obsessed with makeup, true crime, and uncovering the motives that drive people to do what they do. What this means is that every single week I post a brand new video looking at a real life crime from a psychological perspective. Oh, and every single second week, I post a full, easy to follow makeup tutorial whilst discussing these cases. During these episodes, I also try to share psychological knowledge and concepts that you may or may not already be aware of. So if that all sounds like something that you are keen for, then please consider sticking around and joining the Balaboo family. But if makeup and true crime is not your thing, you are in luck because I also have a podcast Murder and Mayhem, which you can find and stream on all major streaming channels. So just a quick disclaimer for today's episode. Today's episode contains material citing sexual assault and murder. If you feel triggered by any of the material in today's episode, I have also included a link in the description box that will take you to a bunch of mental health resources that you can access no matter where in the world you are situated. I mean, absolutely no disrespect to the victim mentioned, nor her family. The purpose of this video is to shed further light on the heinous crime that was committed, whilst spreading awareness about the psychological nature of the narrative. This story has been thoroughly researched by myself, and includes real-life accounts, footage and images of and from individuals who were involved directly in the case. So, without further ado... On to episode 23. In 2009, when obsession, dangerous desires, and unchecked mental illness combined, an innocent young woman tragically and unnecessarily lost her life. Her story, although not uncommon, is vital to be heard. This is Erin von Rensburg's story. Erin von Rensburg was born on the 28th of April, 1989. She was affectionately known as the late lamb. In Afrikaans, it's the lat lamaki, which basically means a child that is born to their parents later on in the parent's life or a little bit after the other siblings. She grew up with both of her parents, Helen and Errol, as well as her siblings, Byron and Neshka. She had a wonderful childhood growing up and she found joy and happiness 
in exploring and learning new things. Her two older siblings absolutely adored her and the three of them were incredibly close. Her brother was always her protector growing up because not only was she his baby sister, but she was the baby of the family. As she grew up, she was described as an absolute joy, a ball of radiant positive energy, and she had a large group of friends. She absolutely loved her family and she adored her friends. And things never really changed as she grew older. After finishing school, she decided that she wanted to go study at the University of Stellenbosch, where her brother Byron was already studying. She went into marketing as she felt like she could express her passion there and that it was right up her alley. And so she moved into the second bedroom of the two-bedroom apartment that her brother Byron had been living in. Her parents felt as though it would be safer for her to be living there with Byron as opposed to being a young woman living on her own. The sad irony of this decision and idea would later be known. She was absolutely fascinated with Japan and Japanese culture, and she one day dreamed of visiting the country. She'd even taught herself how to speak Japanese. She was also brilliant at drawing anime, and she enjoyed spending her time on her art too. So, as I mentioned, Erin shared a flat in Stellenbosch with her brother Byron, and this is how she would ultimately meet her killer. On the 20th of August 2008, she met Jakobus Johannes Extian. Byron used to have friends over for card games, to watch the rugby, and just to get up to usual college shenanigans. And it was through one of these gatherings that Jakobus and Aaron had met. He had seemed shy at first, but their eyes had met from across the room, and they seemed to be a spark. Two of them had flirted for the majority of the night, and eventually they had kissed. For Erin, it was innocent. It was fun. It was a party. It was college. The two began to text one another, and very soon Jakobus was expressing the notion that he was serious about her, and he wanted a relationship with her. Erin, however, was not ready for that. She was busy with university, with her friends, with her family, and she wanted to focus on that. So that's exactly what she told him. He, however, was quite persistent and unrelenting, and so eventually she had told him that perhaps in the future she may have more time and be ready for a relationship. I mean, it wasn't that she didn't like him per se, but she didn't want a relationship with him or a relationship in general at that point in time. And at the end of the day, to avoid sounding like a broken record, I mean, it's her body, her choice, her own free will. And keep in mind, she was also a second year marketing student, so she had enough on her plate as it was. In September, she had texted him to let him know that she was thinking about him and they had texted back and forth. However, when the last trimester of university began, Erin's workload intensified and she realized that she just didn't have time to balance and manage that type of back and forth with Jakobus. She thought Jakobus was nice and she didn't know why, but she just didn't feel romantically inclined towards him. Maybe she had once in the past, or maybe she was just being polite. As a woman in South Africa, and really just in general, it's safer and easier to gently let a man down to avoid injuring his ego and endangering your own life. As controversial as that opinion may be, It's unfortunately the sad reality. But anyway, Erin had politely explained for the umpteenth time the situation to Jakobus and then she had returned to the piles of assignments and test prep that were waiting for her. It was a few days later when she had received a nasty text message from Jakobus. That message pretty much confirmed the gut feeling that she had had And she decided then and there that she was going to have absolutely nothing 
to do with him from that point on. However, he continued to attempt to contact her in order to fix the situation, but she wasn't interested and she left it at that. He continued to hassle her at all hours of the day until she had his number blocked. She had also asked her brother to please speak to him, which Byron had done in November, and Extian had said that he was no longer interested in Erin anyway, and so he would leave her alone. In Erin's mind, things were over. Well, they hadn't actually ever really begun, and so she moved on with her life. However, on the other end of the line, Jokobus began to plot and plan his revenge on the girl that he believed had wronged him. Let's get into not only the days, but the years leading up to this horrific crime. Jakobus Johannes Extian was born to Mariette and Kurs Extian, who were both beloved doctors in the small town of Uppington, where he grew up. He was always a good student, and in school, he was an honor student. Outside of academics though, growing up, Jokobus was unable to connect with others on a social level. According to his brother, Oerstwald Extian, he only had a small group of friends and he was not a ladies man by any stretch of the imagination. So he never used to have girls over and he kind of preferred to keep to himself. He was most at home academically where he excelled and he was considered to be more of a nerd. He was known and recognized by many throughout his childhood and adult years as being different, weird and odd. Their words, not mine. After matriculating, Jakobus enrolled as a computer science student at Stellenbosch University. It was around this time that Jakobus became friends with Byron, Aaron's brother. And at the time of Jakobus meeting Aaron, Byron and himself had been friends for around six years. And it was through Byron that Jakobus had met the girl of his dreams. Aaron von Rensburg. They'd headed off at that party one night and he knew when looking at her that she was the girl that he was going to spend the rest of his life with. He wasn't very good with social interactions, especially when it came to social interactions with a female. But that night had ended with a kiss from the gorgeous Aaron. And he knew in that moment that he was in love. His heart was a flatter, and in the days that followed, he exchanged text messages with Erin, and he let her know how he was feeling, that he was serious about her, and that he couldn't wait to take their relationship to the next level. She expressed disinterest in having a relationship with him, but he knew deep down that it was only a matter of time until she came around. Sure enough, in September, she had messaged him saying that she was thinking about him. He knew right then and there that she was going to be the girl that he one day married and the woman who would be the mother to his children. And he would later go on to state these exact notions in court. However, as quick as his dream future was built, it was destroyed. Aaron was busy and still not interested in a relationship. He persisted. He texted, he called, he questioned. But when he didn't get the answers that he wanted, he turned nasty. And then he realized that perhaps nastiness was not the way to go. So he tried to play nice, but it was too late. Erin wouldn't speak to him. She wouldn't see him. She blocked his phone number. He couldn't study. He couldn't focus. His usual pristine academic record fell to shambles as he only passed four subjects. He was convinced that this was her fault. She was to blame. His life was ruined. This was his last year of studying. He wasn't going to find a good job. And it was all because of her. She had moved on. She was dating someone, even after telling him that she didn't want a relationship. She 
didn't choose him. He would not stand for this any longer. And so he decided that something had to be done. He was obsessed and no one and nothing would stand in his way or stop him. In his mind, she ended his life. And so he was going to end hers. In the weeks that followed, Jakubas plotted and planned. He purchased two stun guns over the internet and he bought rope. On the 31st of May 2009, Jakubas put his plan into action. So it was exam time and Byron was actually in Belleville at his sister's mother-in-law's home where there was a spare room that was peaceful and quiet and he was studying there. Knowing this and keeping this in mind, Jakobus had asked Byron if he could please come over and work on his computer. The only other person who stood in his way was Aaron's boyfriend Mark who was writing an exam on that day. That ensured that Aaron would be alone at home during this time. Byron didn't think too much about this arrangement as Jakobus had been his friend for over six years. And remember in November, he had already spoken to Jakobus and they had sorted things out. So he didn't have any reason to suspect him. I mean, why would he? So. Aaron had let Jakobus into the home and Jakobus had gone straight to Byron's room and began to work on his computer. Jakobus had brought a luggage bag on wheels with him to the apartment which contained rope, a pair of socks and a stun gun, all of which would be used to exact his plan. He had then lured Erin into the room by asking her to please point out something, the location of a file on the computer. It was at this point when she was leaning over the computer that he had pulled out a stun gun and tried to shock her on her neck. He knew that it would be easier to abduct her if she was unconscious. The stun gun, however, only hurt her, but it didn't render her unconscious. And she didn't go down without a fight. After a brief struggle, Jokobas ended up hitting her in the stomach, but Erin continued to try to escape multiple times. Eventually, Jokobas managed to get his hands around her neck and he kept them there until she lost consciousness. At this point, he stuffed a sock in her mouth and he covered it with tape. But in a horrific turn of events, Erin regained consciousness twice, which eventually led to Jokobas tying a rope around her neck. He then put her into the black bin bags that he had brought with him, placed her into the boot of his car and drove to his parents' holiday home in Langebach. Keep in mind, both of his parents live in Uppington. At the family home, he undresses her and he rapes her. According to him, she was unconscious at the time, but she was still very much alive throughout this ordeal. After he was done and got dressed, he realized that it appeared that she wasn't breathing anymore. Her heart appeared to have stopped. And thus, any form of explanation to her supposed treatment of him would not be possible. So he put her body back into black bags, wrapped in a duvet, and placed her in the boot of his car along with a shovel. He then drove to Elan's Bay where he buried her body in an almost two meter deep hole at the top of a high sand dune. And he continued, as though nothing had happened. Back in Stellenbosch, however, Erin's friend Mark had returned to the apartment after his exam, only to find the apartment locked and Erin was nowhere in sight. He called her phone, but there was no answer. After walking around and seeing her car still in the parking lot, he then called Byron to voice his concerns as none of the people that he had phoned were able to locate her either. Byron drove from Belleville to the apartment as he obviously had a set of keys. He unlocked the door and checked the flat and he later went on to phone his father, who was in Mossel Bay, to get advice on what to do next. Upon advice from his father, he went to go and check in Erin's room and he saw that all of her pairs of shoes, along with her wallet and her ID, was still in her room. It was at this point that his father, Errol, had told him to report her as missing 
to the police. Her father then began the drive from Mossel Bay to Stellenbosch. During this time, Byron immediately thought of Jakobus, as he remembered that Jakobus was supposed to have come over to work on the computer. Upon attempting to report her missing, the police had almost dismissed the case as just another young student who had gone out partying, blah blah blah, but Errol and Byron were adamant that Jacobus had something to do with her disappearance. Jacobus, being the only suspect, was questioned and using his cell phone records, Errol and the investigative team were able to map out his route on the day of Erin's disappearance. They were also able to see that for five hours that day, his phone indicated that he was by the beach by Elans Bay. Her father knew then in his heart that it was too late. He had then called his daughter and told her to prepare for the worst. Erin's body was found on Wednesday. Jacobus had led investigators to the exact point where her body was buried. Later evidence would arise that the murder was incredibly cruel, as the cause of death was suffocation, which meant that Erin was still alive at the time of being buried. Jacobus showed no remorse, even when Erin's body was being exhumed from the hole that he had left her in. He instead was arguing about rugby players with the team that were on site at that time, and he barely stopped his conversation to confirm that it was indeed her. Jacobus was remanded into custody and he was denied bail due to the fear of community outrage if he was released. He was held in Stellenbosch prison whilst awaiting further action. However, on the 17th of May 2010, he was moved to Polsmore Prison. His legal counsel objected multiple times to the move, stating that the only family members he had in Cape Town were situated in Stellenbosch and Durbanville. The decision of the magistrate was final, and Jacobus would spend the next few years in Polsmore waiting. Almost three years later, his plea bargain hearing took place. I will mention some of the contents of the plea bargain document, which ultimately detailed the string of events leading up to the murder, including the murder and after the murder of Erin von Rensburg. The document read, The accused believed that she, being Erin, caused the end of his academic career. He believed that if someone wronged him in life, that person must be punished. He believes she held him on a string, was not honest with him, and hurt him. She ruined his chances of graduating and getting a good job. It goes on to state, The accused decided that his life had come to an end because of her, and that it was only right to end her life as well. After concluding the plea bargain, Jacobus Johannes Extian appeared before the judge at the Western Cape High Court and he received his sentence of 30 years. All three charges against him were combined into one for the purpose of sentencing. In the agreement, Jacobus had admitted that his actions were wrong. Jacobus opted not to appeal his sentence or conviction after discussion with his legal counsel. Erin van Rensburg was laid to rest in a small private service with friends and family from around the globe. The media was not invited. Her father said that he hoped that the publicized accounts of his daughter's murder would prevent future murders from happening. But he later remarked, how are you going to guard against the people you know? He would also later state to a media source, Erin is just another statistic. For us, it's a personal tragedy. But for the rest of the country, she's just another statistic. The angle that you need to get across in your story is how South African men treat women. What is the mentality that allows this sort of thing to happen? It's time for guys to start working out that women are actually people too. And if they say no, they mean no, and that's that. I mean, mic drop, I can't even add anything to that. It really sums up everything I feel. 
So this brings me to the segment of my episode where I discuss the minds and the motives behind the madness. It's important to note though straight off the bat that the presence of one or more disorders does not diffuse any responsibility from the perpetrator. Jakobus was dealing with many untreated and unmanaged disorders as per report by psychiatrist Larissa Panieri peter In 2010, after his arrest, Jokubas was referred to Falkenberg Mental Hospital for evaluation. However, he was deemed fit to stand trial. This basically means that although his mental disorders may have contributed to the situation and the event that occurred, during the actual event itself, he was fully cognizant and aware of what was going on. I'm pretty sure this is also evidence in the fact that Aaron's murder was meticulously planned, not a spur-of-the-moment emotional killing. So what else did the psychiatrist mention? Well firstly she noted pervasive developmental disorder. This is now known as being an autism spectrum disorder. Characteristics of those diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder include but are not limited to poor social skills, fixation issues, treating people as tools or objects, unintentionally aggressive at times, a desire to be alone, a reluctance to make eye contact, and a lack of social empathy, amongst other things. There are 10 more common features of this disorder. These are just the ones that stuck out the most to me in regards to Jacobus. She also went on to state that he showed signs of obsessive compulsive disorder as well as major depressive disorder. Obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, is a disorder in which people have recurring unwanted thoughts, ideas, or sensations, also known as obsessions, that make them feel driven to do something repetitively, compulsions. For people with OCD, thoughts are persistent and behaviors are rigid. Not performing the behaviors commonly causes great distress. Even if they know their obsessions are not realistic, people with OCD have difficulty disengaging from the obsessive thoughts or stopping the compulsive actions. Major depressive disorder is a mood disorder that causes a persistent feeling of sadness and a loss of interest. It affects how one feels, thinks, and behaves and can lead to a variety of emotional and physical problems. This may lead to trouble completing normal day-to-day activities, and these episodes can last days, or sometimes weeks or months. The psychiatrist also noted one particularly strong belief, and this was Jakobus's belief in symmetry. In his later accounts, he admitted that he believed that someone who did something wrong deserved to be punished. This was the balance or the symmetry of the world. Erin's rejection, however polite, vilified her, turning her into the bad one and Jacobus into the victim, at least within Jacobus's mind. So another concept or rather behavior that is intrinsically linked to Jacobus and this case is a behavior that is getting more and more attention these days especially given the presence of social media, and that is stalking. When looking at stalking behavior, most stalkers do not suffer from hallucinations or delusions, but rather from depressive disorders or even personality disorders. A personality disorder such as psychopathy could also lead to explaining the lack of remorse and empathy that Jokubas displayed. Stalking is not a disorder. However, it is a behavior that falls under the umbrella of symptoms for various disorders. The behavior of Jokubas prior to the murder ties into the notion of the resentful stalker. This kind of stalker experiences feelings of injustice and they desire revenge against their victim. Their behavior reflects the perception that they have been humiliated and treated unfairly, and they always regard themselves as the victim, never the perpetrator. According to research, it's uncommon to encounter a stalker with adequate interpersonal and social skills. Having difficulties establishing or maintaining intimate relationships 
are the crux of these episodes. Evident within the inability of Jakobus to start a relationship with Eren. The rejection he experienced with Eren would be sufficient, in his mind, to trigger his latent obsessive behavior. To another person though, they would have been like, okay, well, she's not interested in me, so let me move on. But no, not Jacobus. With nothing else to consume his thoughts, his attention was placed solely on Erin and the pursuit of her. And this obsession would have dire consequences. Erin von Rensburg was a beautiful young girl with her whole life ahead of her. Her time on this earth was cut short for no reason other than an obsession that turned fatal. Jakobus continuously ignored the pervasive issues that plagued him from his childhood. And it was his lack of touch with reality that ultimately led to tragic consequences for this young woman. Although he is behind bars now, nothing can bring back Erin or the many women out there like her. The women who have been murdered at the hands of someone they knew, someone they never suspected of being capable of that. And ultimately, how can we, as women, protect ourselves when the danger we fear the most could be found in the face of someone we know? Until next time, stay safe, stay blessed, and stay the amazing human beings that I know you all are.